Rock and roll. <laughs> Hormones, hormones, hormones here and there. Hormones, 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 hormones everywhere. Well, there's hormones in the thyroid for our metabolic rate. That's what we'll study today at any rate. There's feedback loops and circuits that are very rarely seen. And in this course, we'll study them and we will not be mean. Hormones, hormones, hormones here and there. Hormones, 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 hormones everywhere. Hormones, 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 hormones everywhere. Hi, and welcome back to Hormone Circuits, Lecture 9. Uh, today's topic will be the thyroid system and its discontents. And it's like a nice deep sigh of relief. <sighs> and... Uh, smile a little bit, maybe uh, enjoy the opportunity to do some science and think about interesting biology. And uh, that's the welcome and the breath part. Uh, as a matter of review, if we think about the arc of the course is lecture nine, we'll go until we just have a few more lectures to go. And uh, we started with the leptin circuit and saw how the appetite nullcline and the diet nullcline help us understand a uh, weight set point. Then we move to the um, insulin glucose system with a very tight control of uh, glucose and saw how cell mass can compensate for physiological changes and why diseases happen. In subclinical, like prediabetes goes to diabetes because of lack of compensation. We move to the amazing world of hypo HP axis, hypothalamus pituitary axis, to study the stress axis and talks about bipolar disorder and depression and um, then we talked about ovulation and saw how ovulation number is chosen. That's another HP axis, HP over axis. And today we'll study another, uh, an important uh, major endocrine axis, HP thyroid axis. Um, and this is a kind of a um, part of a two lecture mini series about autoimmune diseases. So the thyroid is, a, is an organ that's very important, but a lot of people have mysterious diseases where the body attacks the thyroid. Just like type 1 diabetes, the body attacks beta cells, the body likes to attack the thyroid. And we should, in the next lecture, we'll understand a theory for the origin. Why does the body attack itself? And why does it attack some organs and not others? What is going on here? What is the physiological purpose of the body attacking itself? Of course, not of disease, but of of the machinery that makes the disease. That's our little two lecture series. And today will be part one, where we'll talk about the biology of the thyroid and its autoimmune diseases. So we can understand the next lecture about the origin of autoimmune diseases. So that's our plan. Our goal. Understand the biology of autoimmune diseases to set the stage for the next lecture. That's our goal. So the thyroid is an organ that sits like in this picture here, right? and the front of our neck, and it looks like a butterfly. And it's, <laughs> it's one of those endocrine organs that people have known about for thousands of years, because sometimes when you don't have iodine, it can grow to this size, like this, 10 times inside, that's called goiter. So it's definitely a gland that can grow and shrink, also uh, during pregnancy and things like that. And uh, it's, it's crucially important for controlling our metabolic rate, as we'll understand in this lecture. Um, so let's go to work. So we're in the context of the hypothalamic pituitary axes. So in our brain, the, the hypothalamus that sends 
hormones to the pituitary gland. We call these hormones X1. And the pituitary gland has cells that send hormone X2 to the effector gland. So for example, the adrenal that makes X3, which is the hormone that does the work and shuts down the production of X1 and X2. Remember that? That's our, and then we also had that the glands grow. And, um, and the hormones are the growth factors. So that when you kind of need more hormone, the gland also grows. This is like the scheme we saw. A was the adrenal, and this was cortisol for stress. And HP axis, there's several of them for major biological functions of the human being, what we care about. We care about stress, sex, e meta metabolism, and growth. So there's another X1. It's the same circuit, basically, through the pituitary with its own X1, X2, and X3. We have the HP ovary axis with estrogen. This is for ovulation. We have the HP thyroid axis with the thyroid hormone. That's for metabolism. And we have the HPA for stress. And there's others, too. There is the HP liver that makes IGF-1. That's for growth. And there's one also for lactation that makes uh, prolactin for lactation for milk when you're giving birth. So they have a similar design. It's not exactly the same, but similar design with a feedback loop and glands that can grow. And it gives a slow time, scale time effects. Why is it that you have this one kind of set of organs for the different biological functions is an interesting question. Inside the pituitary, there's different cell types that make, for, there's different cell types that make the X2 for each of these um, pathways. And they're in a certain way, they're kind of uh, can coordinate with each other. So you can maybe imagine that if you're in stress, it shuts down the other pathways. It shuts down reproduction and growth because you're in stress right now, no time to line the uterus or to um, you, you re devote resources to stress. And so maybe there's a coordination aspect to it. And the pituitary is also great, a great kind of amplifier. A little bit of hormone from the brain can amplify it here to go to the blood and go into this effector glands, which again amplify and push to the entire circulation. And so that's it's also an, like a biochemical amplifier. But it's interesting to think, well, maybe it's also a really cool regulatory design with a lot of uh, benefits like dynamic compensation that we discussed. And that's why you, it evolved again and again to, to meet the same engineering requirements. That's the why question. I'm gonna wait till somebody chats a, a, chats a, a question because I'm really fed by your questions about these HP axes. Um, Please, please chat a question so we can start, start off the discussion. And I can feel I'm uh, talking with you as if we're talking face to face, you know. Um, HP axes. This is your chance to be the first to ask a question as you reach for your keyboard. Not going to continue until somebody chats a question. Oh, well, somebody chatted a question. Um, does X3 inhibit X1 and Susan all? Okay, so the question is, does X3, the effector hormone, inhibit X1 and X2 in all the other axes? And the answer is yes. For example, we'll see that um, the X2 here is called thyroid stimulating hormone and T4 shuts down its production. And H1 here is called thy thyroid releasing hormone and, T and thyroid hormone also shuts it down. And that's, that's conserved in all those pathways, this design. 
Uh, I'm not aware of an exception, but maybe one of my uh, students can type if there's Blab. an exception. Does it work? Um, yeah, and wait. All right. So, oh, great. Okay, better. Uh, which of these axes is active in the embryo? <laughs> so, we're going to devote a lecture, I think, to the hormones across the lifespan. Just the make embryo, coffee. To the baby to the child. Yeah. Puberty teen to the adult to the old person and see how these axes change over time. So let's wait with that question and that lecture. And I'll just preempt and say there's a fascinating series where you gain one axis after the other while keeping all the previous ones that you have. And thyroid axis is already active in the embryo. Metabolism, after all, you know, is a major, um, major thing that embryo needs, whereas reproduction, you can imagine, only in puberty. Interesting, right? The hormones, so powerful. They're everywhere. <laughs> yeah. All right, so uh, what is this thyroid hormone, and what, we're going to delve into the thyroid a little bit more than usual, into this organ, because we understand its diseases, and the... Um, And I've already told you that um, the hormones are called thyroid stimulating hormone. And this is, a, this is a thyroid and makes a hormone called T4. Thyroid hormone is called T4. I'll show you why. Thyroid hormone is really good for controlling metabolism. It goes into all cells in our body. There's a receptor for it, and it controls a, a lot of heart functions a lot of um, speed of metabolism. I'll show you, I'll tell you exactly what it does in a second. Just let's remember now it's a really important global regulator. And I just want to tell you about its, uh, how, it's, how it looks. So the thyroid hormone is interesting. It's made of two tyrosines. So these tyrosines have these aromatic rings and it's, Link, it's two of these linked, and then there's another kind of chain here. And thyroid hormone has iodine. Iodine, the ion, you know, find it in fish and nutrition. It's you find it in thyroid hormone. So iodine, 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 iodine. If I'm not mistaken, maybe I didn't draw exactly the right position of the iodine. I didn't. And that's why it's called T4. It's thyroxin 4. It has four iodines like that. Okay. So two tyrosines, more or less, with four iodines. You have to eat iodine. If you don't have iodine, you have problems. And you will see you have this goiter disease. So low iodine in your diet gets you... Um, goiter which is very large thyroid and that's our principle we know of dynamic compensation right of th thyroid if there's not enough thyroid hormone not enough thyroid hormone it doesn't suppress tsh tsh goes up and tsh makes the thyroid grow see so that's we already see in our course principles by now we don't need the math we can take away the scaffold to understand what's going on if we don't have iodine, you can't make this T4, and therefore you unlock TSH, TSH goes up, and it's a growth factor for the thyroid, and you get goiter. And goiter, in old times, there were, especially people away from the sea who couldn't eat fish, there was a problem with iodine, and you see people walking around with watermelons like this, and have trouble breathing because of their goiter. Yeah. If this happens, by the way, to babies, there was a question about the embryo. If you don't have thyroid hormone as a baby, then your brain doesn't develop and you uh, have mental uh, def 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 deficiencies, bone deficiencies, and that's a disease, disease that used to be called cretinism. It's a special kind of um, this lifelong disorder. And by the way, babies now born with too little thyroid 
you take a TSH test, if the TSH is very high, you say, oh, maybe there's not enough thyroid hormone. And if you treat it within the first two weeks, the baby's okay. After two to four weeks, there could be severe cognitive defects. That's why you take a TSH test for babies. So TSH we already see is a clinically important hormone because if there's low thyroid hormone, TSH is just like a marker, you can see. It's very sensitive, very sensitive. So TSH makes the thyroid grow and secrete the hormone. It's a major important. And if I want to draw a little graph here, TS, there's a range of, let's say, between 10 and 20 units for T4. You can be anywhere in this range. TSH is very, very sensitive to this level. And that's why I'm going to draw here log TSH. So it's almost an exponential dependence. So it can go between um, 0 0.05 and 500. Log, you know, so I, I'm going to write here. 10 to the minus 2, 10 to the minus 1, 1 in, in units, 10, 100, 1,000. All these are viable TSH numbers. You can get them in tests. Okay? So it's almost like a logarithmic dependence. In fact, it's made of three regimes we'll discuss. But and that's why TSH is such a great sensitive test for thyroid hormone. And even before you have a problem, TSH could be outside of its range. Before you have a clinical problem. It's like, uh, of course, so that's why when you go for routine checkups, you measure TSH. And rarely you measure thyroid hormone too, but you can also measure thyroid hormone, but TSH is the sensitive one, the good one. It's such important hormone. And that's now we're getting into endocrinology. So because of this feedback loop, TSH and T4 are opposite. If T4 is too low, TSH is high. If T4 is too high, TSH is low. Yeah. I think I got that point home, right? Yeah. Now, um, let's look at the crazy way that this hormone is made inside the thyroid. And I wanna, it's going to be show up later, but, but I want to share with you this little way that uh, our body does things. So if we now look inside the thyroid, we see that it's made of um, spherical uh, modules. They're actually called follicles, but not like the ovarian follicles, which are also spherical nodules. These are thyroid follicles. Okay? And the way they look, their size is, let's say, 400 microns, or half a millimeter. And they have a layer of epithelial cells called thyrocytes or thyroid follicular cells. And they're the ones who make the hormone. And inside here, there's something called the colloid, which is a liquid that has a lot of iodine. It concentrates the iodine. Now let's see how it makes this couple of tyrosines. Okay, how does it do it? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to zoom in here on one of these cells. Okay, I'm going to zoom in one of these cells. This is cell. Here is a colloid. Here on this side is, uh, is the outside where there's a lot of blood vessels and stuff like that. Right? So the way was it? Iodine from the diet you eat is pumped into the cell. And then it's pumped into the colloid by another transporter. Now, the cell makes a lot of protein called thyroglobulin. And this thyroglobulin has a lot of tyrosines on it. A lot, a lot of tyrosines. Why is the symbol for tyrosine? So it has a lot of these. So it exports thyroglobulin out into the colloid. So the colloid has a lot of thyroglobulin here. Now on the membrane, there's another important enzyme, TPO, peroxidase, thyroid peroxidase. And these will, I'm, just, I'm giving you the names in this lecture because they'll show up later. Thyroid peroxidase connects the iodines to these tyrosines and 
glues two tyrosines together. There's these two reactions. So now we have tyroglobulin with a lot of little pieces that look like thyroid hormone on it. And then it exp Im imports this thing into the cell, into a, a lysosome that's full of degradative enzymes and cuts up this thyroglobulin into pieces and extracts the thyroid hormone and through yet another transporter shuttles it out. So it takes the iodine, makes the thyroglobulin, puts it here, does the chemical reaction here, transports it, the thyroglobulin back, cuts it up into pieces, in, in, extracts the T4 and shuttles it out. And I should say that, just in just the detail, if I lose one of these iodines, I get something called T3. And T3 is actually the active form. And there's an enzyme called diiodinase that gets rid of this I. And that enzyme is found in all the tissues in our body. So the T4 gets there and it's converted into T3 on the spot, which is the active form. And that's how the, the tissues can control a little bit how much thyroid hormone they have too. In the brain, the very thyroid hormone, very important for the brain. So there's special diiodinase for the brain, special diiodinase in the pituitary for this feedback loop. That, that's, a, that's a detail. And, and the thyroid also makes a little bit of T, T4, T3 too, but most of the T3 is made in the body. But we'll, we'll forget about that. I'm just gonna talk about T4, uh, which is the, we'll call it thyroid hormone. Okay, okay any questions about this? go out, go back in, root of making iodine and everything I said so far. Uh, he asked, turning on his chat, hoping to see a, a message in the chat. Maybe somebody will ask a question and he can see if he explained himself clearly as he talked about himself in third person. <laughs> in his desperation, he took up his guitar. Why is my heart beating so fast? Why am I feeling so warm? Why am I feeling fatigue and muscle pain? Why am I eating more and losing weight? As I'm listening for your questions, <laughs> what I just described is simple symptoms of hyperthyroidism, right? When you have too much hyper, you have too much thyroid, you have too much high thyroid hormone, right? Why is my heart beating faster? Why am I losing weight? Though I'm eating more. Don't they know? It's the end of my thyroid. My body's fighting an autoimmune war. So, okay, so let's continue. What sense is T3 active? What is this action in the cell? Why, why do I say T3 is active? So the way uh, thyroid hormone works is if we look at, at a typical cell in the body, let's say a heart cell or a fat cell or so forth, then it has a receptor for thyroid hormone. And the T3 binds it very strongly and then it goes into the nucleus and causes genes to be expressed and proteins to be made. That's the way this, so T3 binds the receptor more strongly than T4. That's why it's called the active um, form. Did I explain myself? Uh, what is the chemical properties of the pres that justifies the presence of iodine? So the question is, why do we need a hormone that depends on iodine? What a drag, because if you don't eat fish and stuff, you don't have this hormone. So what's, and this hormone is conserved through all vertebrates. So the, our common ancestor of us and the cats and the fish and the, you know, all the vertebrates um, have this 
thyroid hormone uh, with the iodine. So what is the big, I don't know. I don't know the answer. I mean, it's fascinating. It's maybe an ancient memory of iodine being connected with certain environments, maybe in the sea, for example. Um, you know, that our salt concentration in our blood is very close to salt concentration in the sea. Maybe it's a memory of the, our marine origins. Good question. Does, if anybody has an idea, I'd be very happy to know. Okay, so um, see these questions, you know, never occurred to me. So T4, TSH, the structure, we talked about TG and TPO, these two uh, proteins that we'll remember, right, are important for later. Okay, so now I'm going to um, talk about diseases of the thyroid. So everything is working fine. Thyroid hormone is held constant. It's maybe uh, when you're sick or starving, the brain, the hypothalamus says, make less, thyroid, less TRH, less TSH, make a little bit less thyroid hormone, and that's called sick thyroid syndrome, low TSH and low T4 together. And the body kind of saves energy or something like that when you're starving, when you're... Um, but in general, it's kept constant. It's just supposed to keep the thing constant, all right? It's a constant production. I mean, what's so difficult about that? So this thyroid is, it makes us... It gives a lot of people a, a lot of trouble. Uh, when I tell you a lot of people, maybe as much as five, ten percent of the population, especially women, have problem with the um, thyroid. And so these problems get classified into two kinds: hyperthyroidism and hypothyroidism. So I'm going to tell you what it feels like to have hyperthyroidism and hypothyroidism, and that way you can understand the importance of this hormone, the function of this hormone. So the hyper Thyroidism is when you have a uh, fast heartbeat. So thyroid hormone uh, accelerates to the degree that you can have arrhythmias and dangerous, that's the most dangerous part of it. You have, you eat less but gain weight. No, sorry, you eat more and lose weight. This part, I'm just going to remember our first couple of lectures. I'm just going to remind you, we have the food intake, you and the fat. And we had our diet line and our appetite line. What thyroid, hyperthyroidism is, you, you spend more energy. So for a given food intake, you're less fat because you, you spend more energy. So what this does is it basically, this is what hyperthyroidism does. And therefore, it's, you have lower fat and higher food. So you remember that uh, paradoxical kind of or opposing effect. Right. So eat more and lose weight. You have muscle pain and weakness because um, thyroid hormone uh, at high levels makes the muscles kind of start to break down into amino acids and things like that. And you have um, labile thoughts. So a kind of a, a little bit like, like a mania kind of situation with running thoughts and anxiety. Yeah. And uh, did I miss anything? Uh, and heat. Intolerance to heat, feel, feel hot, feel sweaty. Because thyroid hormone also activates thermal generation, brown fat and things like that. So in cold climates, you also have a little, the brain also likes to increase thyroid hormone to have more thermal generation, heat generation by ATP, making, breaking ATP and things like that. Right, that's hyper. What about hypo? So it's just the opposite. That's, by the way, hyperthyroidism is the most, one of the most clear manifestations of a disease in medicine. It's like just by the book. Hypo, um, I hope none of you feel any of these symptoms now what I'm going to describe, but if you do, you can get a TSH test. Because you remember, hyperthyroidism, high T4, typically as low TSH. Okay. A hy hypothyroidism, hypothyroidism, is the opposite. So it's slow heartbeat. 
in weak heartbeats. And therefore, you maybe you take, you, you're out of breath when you kind of climb the stairs. So it's the opposite effect on the heart. And you eat the same, but gain weight. Eat the same or, or, or less, eat the same or, or less and gain weight. So again, hyper, hypothyroidism shifts the set point to the other direction. And you also have muscle pain, I'm sorry, and weakness. I don't, I don't know what, what to say about that. And you have depressed thought, depressed, basically a low feeling, slow feeling and depressed feeling. Yeah. And, you, and you feel cold, uh, clammy, bloated, constipated. Oh. So this is hyperthyroidism and hypothyroidism. And I'm gonna also tell you in this lecture how you treat them okay, and what causes them. But, uh, Okay, there's a question or uh, one question is there are the molecules in the tissues called diiodinases that turn T4 to T3 related to the mechanism of organ size control? Uh, very interesting question, I don't know the answer. Um, Michal Shilo says you can also have shaking in hyper so tremor, and because th um, thyroid hormone also uh, very important for the activity of neurons. It's everywhere, <laughs> hormones are. Uh, Yoav Ravid says, I think I'm starting to suffer from hypochondria. So don't worry, you're not alone. It's everyone who hears these things for the first time. Many people start suffering from them, but it's, it's an, an illusion. Um, and Michal says, in hypo, tiredness and loss of memory. That's interesting. All right, so after this uh, disturbing list, which is both for you to know about if you have a loved one that's feeling like that, and get a TSH test and blood test. And if you, and it's easily treatable usually, that's also good news. These diseases are now considered easily treatable, even though there are some cases which are more complicated, but usually easily treatable within control of medicine because of the revolution of understanding hormones and basically of synthesizing thyroid hormone so you can take it in a pill. If you have hypo, you can take it in a pill. And you're fine usually. And if you have hyper, you have drugs that stop production of thyroid hormone. This is because of the wonders of biochemistry understanding this TG and TPO and all this stuff. So you, these are considered diseases that are uncomfortable, maybe take a few months, but generally you can live with them and have a great life with them. Okay. Um, it's an extremely common uh, situation. All right. So uh, where are we? Hyper hypo. Okay. So I want to dig in now. Why you get? What are the? What are these diseases? Right. And because they'll turn out to a lot. And a lot of them are autoimmune diseases. The body attacking the thyroid. The body deciding to attack and destroy the thyroid or to hyperactivate the thyroid. And. I wanted to explain to you how that works, what happens so that we can set the stage for the next lecture where we'll ask, ask what use is it for the body to attack itself? How does this, why does this happen? Okay, um, so. Okay. So um, the main cause of hypothyroidism, so it used to be low iodine. But now in the developed world, you get iodine and salt. And, and that just, that's fine. That, that hardly ever happens anymore. Of course, it still happens into the, parts of the world where there's no public health system to do that. The main cause of hypertension is called Hashimoto disease. And it's the immune system kills 
thyrocytes. Okay. Um, what, what do I mean the immune system kills thyrocytes? So this causes hypothyroidism, right? So what do I mean by the immune system kills thyrocytes? So if I look at this follicle, I have my, my thyrocytes here. The immune system kills thyrocytes um, because, as if the immune system thinks that these thyrocytes are full of viruses. In order to understand that, we should understand what happens when a virus like, like coronavirus infects a cell, puts its genetic material into the cell, the cell starts to make viral proteins. The body wants to kill that cell quickly before it can make new virus particles. There's a trick in the body where every cell in the body cuts pieces of the proteins, all the proteins made in the cell, and presents little pieces of these proteins on kind of identity cards that it has called MHC molecules. So this is a piece of a protein made by the cell. And there's thousands of these MHCs, so the cell is always presenting little pieces sampled from the protein that it makes. And if this pro, if the, the, if this if there's a virus in the cell part of the mhc will make a viral protein will present a viral protein it's not like any other protein seen in the body and the body has special cells <clears throat> white blood cells called t cells whose job is to kill virus infected cells By the way, Hashimoto, when we're talking about hepatitis, it's not a virus. It's a mistake in this process, okay? I'm just telling you about the virus because you have to understand what these T cells are. They're the ones who are gonna mistakenly kill healthy, perfectly healthy thyrocytes. But in the body, they're supposed to look for viral proteins. So they have a special detector. This is the T cell receptor. Each T cell has a different shaped receptor that can recognize a different piece of the of a protein it's called an antigen and if there's a recognition like a lock and key if you recognize the antigen the t cell says oh i see t cells that recognize normal proteins made by the body are eliminated uh, so they don't kill healthy cells so the only T cells supposed to be in the body are ones that recognize viral proteins. And then this T cell kills the viral infected cells by injecting it with poison and by activating receptors that tell the cell to kill itself in two different ways. So if there's any questions about this, now is the time. Our body has cells that can recognize different antigens, basically random we don't know what a virus will look like, so they can recognize random chemicals. If they recognize a protein that the body makes, the body gets rid, gets rid of them, so they don't kill healthy cells. If, and the only ones remaining are supposed to be ones that recognize viral antigens. And that's how virus-infected cells are killed by T cells. Um, I know that was complicated for those of you who didn't come from biology, and for those of you that come from biology, it's obvious. For those of you who study antibodies, and it's super obvious. That's why we have a mixed audience here. And the problem is that for unclear reasons, but reasons that we'll clarify in the next lecture, this is a th thyroid follicle. Our body has, or people with Hashimoto's have T cells that recognize and kill thyroid cells. They recognize and kill thyroid cells. Uh, oh, by the way, everyone has these T cells. That's very mysterious, but only a few people 
let's say 5% of women, few percent of women, let's say 5%, get the autoimmune disease with hypothyroidism. And most of us, they don't go into a disease, thyroid hormones are fine. And incidentally, in this disease, because this follicle is full of hormones, the initial stages could be actually hyper because you spill out a lot of hormone. And then you go to hypo once you start losing your thyroid. Sometimes you have hyperthyroidism and then hypothyroidism, which is a real torture. If you remember those, uh, I mean, hyperthyroidism is, is, is a torture kind of. Uh, all right, so where these T cells are supposed to kill virus cells, in Hashimoto, they think for some reason that the thyroids, the healthy thyroid cells are like viruses. And what do they recognize? What, what proteins do they recognize wrongly as viral proteins? They recognize the antigens are pieces of the two important proteins they talked about before, Tg and Tpo. So the thyroid globulin, the protein that has a lot of tyrosines and is the basis for thyroid hormone, that's cut up in thyroid hormone, and the peroxidase that connects the iodines. Pieces of these proteins are the ones that T cells recognize. So they recognize parts of the hormone making process and they kill the follicle. They kill the thyroid cells and over time you lose your thyroid, you have too low thyroid hormone. Um, okay, some questions. Uh, were there attempts to treat Hashimoto by disabling killing those self T cells? So definitely that's, that's an interesting line of research to kill those T cells, but there's no therapy like that that I'm aware of. Is there anything special in the thyroid that Hashimoto happens? Would we get autoimmune disease for any type of body cell? So Shai, that's a really very important question. First of all, can you get autoimmune disease like this for any type of body part? And the answer is no. It's very specific cell types of the autoimmune disease. For example, beta cells that make insulin get autoimmune disease and that's called type one diabetes. So T cells, other T cells kill beta cells and they recognize a piece of insulin actually, pre-pro-insulin or other enzymes that make insulin. So it's the same principle. They recognize parts of the hormone synthesis and they kill the beta cells. But right next to the beta cells, there's alpha cells that make glucagon, glucagon, if you remember. And there's no, uh, there's no known autoimmune disease where T cells kill alpha cells, only beta cells. So it's very specific, very specific. And we, next lecture, we try to understand why some organs are attacked and others are not. There's also systemic autoimmune disease like lupus, which attacks many parts of the body, but that has a different mechanism. It's antibody based. And these T cell killing diseases are very specific for particular cell types. And usually it's hormone secreting cell types. So we have Hashimoto kills the thyroid. Type one diabetes, sakelet kills beta cells and you don't have insulin. So hypoinsulinemia or hypothyroidism because T cells kill the endocrine organ. There's Addison's disease where T cells kill the adrenal cortex and you have too low cortisol. It's, it's analogous diseases. So a lot of endocrine organs, hormone organs are targets for the body killing the cells. And, and other ones are not, some of them are spared. So we're trying to understand that in the next lecture. It's really fascinating. And now, what, how, does the, how does Hashimoto start? If we all have these T cells that attack the thyroid and where most of us are fine, why, do, why don't we all get? So it seems there's one answer is we need a genetic makeup to make us fragile to this disease. That's the one thing. And that has to do with uh, certain genes like uh, HLA, DR. So these are uh, genes that have to do with the interaction of T cells with the regulatory T cells and with B cells. So it's part of the regulation of the immune system is different. And it's as if those people have a more sensitive immune system that's more likely to think something is a virus. And that of course has an advantage if you're living in a virus infected world, but it's a disadvantage if you cross over to autoimmune diseases. So 
there's a genetic component. Virtually everyone with Hashimoto, and that's why it goes to families, has a certain kind of variant, variant in their immune system that's more trigger happy. Also, the same variant makes it more likely to get type 1 diabetes. And all these endocrine systems have the same genetic fragility, but it's unclear why some people get Hashimoto, some people get type 1 diabetes, but that's, if you have, if you have it in your family, there's a more chance you might get it too because of this background. And the other thing that needs to happen is probably also a virus in, viral infection, like a real viral infection to make the body become alarmed and then make a mistake. So if you have a trigger happy immune system and there's a viral attack that makes the body uh, see a lot of, uh, let's say thyroid proteins in a virus attack context, that's thought to be triggers for these autoimmune diseases. But that part is really unclear. What triggers type one diabetes? What triggers Hashimoto's? It's like a million dollar question. I hope I answered your question. Many T cells are cross-reactive. One T cell receptor can recognize multiple epitopes and not only one, that's correct. So T cells uh, have this kind of lock and they're looking for keys and they can recognize many different keys. That's, that's a more realistic description. Um, all right, so this is Hashimoto's thyroiditis. So this, your questions show me that you, you understand what I'm talking about. T cells are supposed to kill viruses recognize the thyroid proteins, TG and TPO, pieces of proteins falsely as viral proteins and kill thy thyroid cells so much that you, you lose thyroid hormone to dangerous, a dangerous extent, Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Um, I talked about T cells. I also want to talk about B cells. So once you have this killing a virus, normally the, the T cells also activate B cells, which is another kind of white blood cells, to make antibodies. Antibodies are proteins that stick, stick to the virus. They stick to the virus, they stick, stick to the virus infected cells. They also recognize the same antigen. And that's very important. These antibodies are very important. As we know for a coronavirus, for example, after you've been infected, the body remembers those antibodies. So next time you have a virus, you get it doesn't affect you. That's how they also the immunization work. You make the body express some of the coronavirus proteins so that there's immune response and then you make antibodies again, the body makes antibodies against those proteins and you're protected from coronavirus, right? So this is B cell. So when you have a Shimoto, you have antibodies against TG and TPO. And that's the way doctors tell you you have a Shimoto. You have hypothyroidism with all those slow heartbeat, weight gain, low, et cetera, depression. And then you do a blood test and you see you have TG and TPO antibodies. Okay, you've got Hashimoto, that's the gold standard. Now we're gonna treat it. Okay, so how do you treat Hashimoto? By the way, it's, it's likely that those antibodies are not only convenient markers for the doctor, they also play a role in destruction of thyrocytes. So it's not only the T cells killing, it's also the antibodies and making a mess there, marking the cells for destruction and things like that. So it's, that's part of the pathology. All right, so, uh, you know, uh, how do you treat this disease? How do you treat this disease? It's basically lifelong. T4 pills. So you take a synthetic thyroid hormone and you need to take it all your life because this disease, once it starts, it never stops. No, no, don't know how to stop it. It'll destroy your thyroid. But this, these pills kind of can keep you balanced. Most people, it's in 90% of people you can keep balanced. Some people, it's hard to balance and you need to change the dose and change the dose with life situations, with pregnancy, with and, the, and it's a problem for some people. So it's considered a medically solved situation, but a lot of people suffer from not being able to be exactly balanced. And why is that? It's because there's delays in the system. You're trying to balance the system with delays. And here's how it typically looks. So we have thyroid hormone. This is normal. 
And at this point, um, Ashimoto is starting. So it's killing. There's a killing of thyroid cells. For a while, T4 stays normal, but TSH, when there's killing of less, when there's starting to be a problem with T4, TSH gets activated and gets the body to make more T4, all right? So it's, ba it's balancing T4, but TSH is the rising. See that? So there's a stage here where you don't feel anything because your T4 is normal, but your TSH is rising logarithmically actually, like exponentially. And that's how your doctor says, uh-oh, you're gonna have Hashimoto. This is called this subclinical. It's a little bit like prediabetes, but in prediabetes, it's the glucose that's rising. Here, the important thing is actually staying normal, but the, the, its upstream hormone is rising. In the glucose system, remember, we had beta cells making insulin to control glucose. There's no pituitary. There's, it's a one cell system. Here we have the pituitary, so there's another hormone. And that's a big advantage, because we can have a stage where T4 is normal, and the pituitary is actually actually growing and uh, making more TSH and trying to make the thyroid grow to compensate for the killing and everything is great, okay? So you have subclinical Hashimoto. And then pituitary can't grow forever. It hits its carrying capacity. Can't compensate anymore. Pituitary, after all, remember, is a small organ encased in the skull. It can't grow forever. There's other cell types here, there, carrying capacity. And when that happens, T4 starts falling. Yeah? Because pituitary cannot compensate anymore. And then we get into the stage of the clinical disease. And that's when you go to the doctor. If you have a friend who took this course and says, look, go to the doctor, get a TSH test. TSH, 300, not five or something. It starts at between 0.5 and five normal range. TSH, 30, TSH is 500. Ah! Thyroid hormone is not 10, it's like five. Ah, big problem, okay. So this is like, this is a log scale, right? This is a normal scale. And now you start the treatment. You take the pills. How long does it take thyroid hormone to normalize? Really quickly. The, the thyroid hormone has a half-life of seven days. So in a week or so, you're stabilized. Okay. But TSH stays high. And that's weird. This is the delay part. And all endocrinologists know this. They take TSH six weeks to normalize after thyroid hormone has normalized. The delay is from this normalization stage. So after thyroid hormone is normalized, six weeks after thyroid hormone is normalized. Thanks to the pills, right? So this was called hormone supplement. And this is a puzzling the six week delay, unless you know the model that we've been laboring on in this course. And then you understand what does this delay come from? And the, the reason for this delay is that during this compensation, if I draw the pituitary like this, it's grown as much as it can. So here you have a large pituitary and it's making more thyroid hormone in the normal, for a normal T4, the pituitary is so big, it's making more TSH. It takes it six weeks. This time scale we discussed in this course many times, which is the turnover time of the pituitary cells that make TSH, they're called thyrotropes, to go back to normal. So we can understand the delay based on the principles. We can understand why there's a subclinical disease that goes to a clinical disease because of the carrying capacity, and why then there's a delay 
famous six-week delay. By the way, doctors who don't know this do a TCH test and say, oh, look, there's a thyroid problem, and the endocrinologist says, relax, it's a six-week delay. We know it, right? So relax. And so, so that's, we can understand from our course the dynamics of this disease. Autoimmune killing seems to be cyclical and, re and relentless. As the T cells kill thyrocytes, the thyrocytes release the TG and TPO, and that's sensed by antigen presenting cells as a, more evidence for a virus, and that makes more killing. And there's like a, apparently an autocatalytic cycle where the body gets more and more excited that there must be a virus, but in fact, it's T cells killing normal cells and spilling out antigen. So there's no known way to stop type 1 diabetes or Hashimoto's. It's just, it would be great to stop them, but there's no known way to stop them. And they just keep going on and on. Um, are people with autoimmune diseases less prone to other diseases? Is a question. Being more trigger happy increases false positive, but lowers false negative. So I'm not sure about that. My hypothesis is that the trigger happy immune system evolved in the past, in a past situation where it had an advantage. For example, uh, bacteria and viruses were much more common, uh, life threatening, and then it's good when you're young to exaggerate with your immune response at the cost of a few percent of the people getting autoimmune diseases, whereas in the modern world, that's no longer the case. So I would guess that the people like that will be protected against some of the diseases we evolved with. People with autoimmunity sometimes also have a little bit better chance with melanoma because there's also an autoimmune disease that attacks pigment cells called um, vitiligo, same idea, T cells kill melanocytes, make white spots on the skin. And there's a better prognosis for melanoma, maybe because the immune system is better at killing cancer cells too. Um, P grows to compensate, Ofer asks. Is there a decreased function of its other roles? So as far as I know, it grows to compensate and it does not compromise its other roles. At the end, there has to be a kind of um, loss. So when you make more of those TSH secreting cells in the pituitary, sometimes other cells turn into TSH secreting cells. And remember that the body can compensate. So if you have fewer, let's say, ACTH secreting cells, the adrenal can compensate for that. So the body can compensate in different ways. And I don't think you get to a problem with the other axes, as far as I know. So, um, but that's really a great research question about the interplay between the HP axis. I think it's, it's something to be researched. So we talked about B cell, B cells. We talked about the treatment of Hashimoto and about the six week delay and how we can understand a lot of things based on the concepts in this course that otherwise would seem mysterious and are even mysterious in, in endocrinology textbooks. And now we can put everything together and reason about these diseases in a, in a, in a special way. And, and now I want to switch to so we talked about Hashimoto's, an autoimmune disease that causes hypothyroidism by destroying the thyroid. I want to talk about the disease that gives you hyperthyroidism. Okay, there's also an autoimmune disease there, but it's a little bit different. And it also, I want to remind you of another aspect that we've learned about in the course. So it's this kind of like an integrating lecture too. And so we're now going to go to Okay, let's, let's just enjoy the racing part of it. So our goal is now to understand the um, cause of hyperthyroidism. So there's two major ones. The first is called toxic nodule. So on top of the thyroid, there's suddenly a growth. This growth um, could be, you can sometimes feel it. You can look at it in the ultrasound. You can put in some radioactive iodine to tell if it's 
actually secreting thyroid hormone. You can image it. So sometimes this secretes thyroid hormone and you have thyroid toxicity. It's like a secreting adenoma. Sometimes it's one, sometimes it's many. Sometimes it doesn't secrete thyroid hormone. That's called a cold. This is a hot nodule, a cold nodule. And then cold nodules are 10 times more likely to become thyroid cancer. Thyroid cancer does not secrete thyroid hormone. Otherwise, it would be easy to detect and we have no problem. Unfortunately, it's not easy to detect. And thyroid hormone is very deadly because it can make metastases. Thyroid cancer can go different parts of your body. So if you have a nodule in your thyroid, better test if it's hot or not. Do a fine needle aspiration. See if it's cancerous. If it's cancerous, you need to get rid of that, your thyroid. And then you have hypothyroidism and you need to take T4 pills for life. That's no better than cancer or at least part of the thyroid, right? But if you have a toxic nodule, you'll get hyperthyroidism, heartbeats, hot flashes. Now, what is going on here? I want to analyze this using our circuits and remember what we talked about in the beta cell lecture. We have a circuit here where we have the thyrocytes secrete T4. T4 shuts, shuts down TSH. TSH makes the thyrocytes secrete more T4. By the way, how does it do this? It increases the production of TG, TPO, all the pumps for iodine, makes it not only, and it makes the, the thyroid increase in size, hypertrophy, and in number, hyperplasia, goiter, basically. So this circuit, we remember, very familiar, beta cells make insulin that controls glucose, glucose makes the beta cells secrete insulin and make them grow and also die at high concentration. So we have this common circuit. What is going on with the toxic nodule? So the thyrocytes have a TSH receptor, of course. How, how can they know about TSH? So they express TSH receptor. Being cells, the thyroid has 10 to the 10 different cells. It has 10 examples of every possible point mutation, guaranteed. So if you have a point mutation in the TSHR receptor, sometimes the TSHR receptor thinks there's more TSH than reality. Why? Because it binds TSH more strongly. There's at least 50 known mutation in TSH receptor that make it think there's too much TSH. So what's going to happen with that mutant? If this is a mutant, it's going to expand and secrete. It makes a toxic nodule. So toxic nodules are activating TSH receptor muta mutants. It's a clone, that's to say, a bunch of cells that or originate from the same parental cell. A mutant cell starts, thinks we need more thyroid hormone. It thinks there's more TSH in actual because its receptor binds TSH more strongly because of the mutation starts dividing and secreting. And that's a big problem that can kill you. If you're untreated for a few years, you can get a toxic thyroid coma and death. A lot of times, heart problems. Treatment is um, surgical removal of the nodule or of the entire thyroid. Yeah, so that's, I want to remind you that we have a problem with these hypersecreting hypersensing mutant that can cause too much hormone. And remember, I, don't know, I just want to remind you, in the beta cells, we were worried about those mutants to make too much insulin, which can kill you because low glucose is deadly. And we had this mechanism where glucotoxicity, where if you... Um, uh, those mutants that think there's too much glucose kill themselves. That's glucotoxicity. And we had a way to eliminate those mutants. Thyroid doesn't have that. Thyroid, if it thinks there's more TSH, it makes more, it'll never stop. It won't kill itself. There's no biphasic mechanism that we discussed in, there's no glucotoxicity, there's no TSH toxicity. So something else has to defend against those mutants. Okay, so that's, that's, I'll leave that as a mystery right now. How can you even have a thyroid if every person has 10 thyroid cells with every possible mutation? We should have 
500 toxic nodules, all of us, but we don't. Right? Only some people do. All right, so I'll leave that to the next lecture. Um, okay, uh, there's a question. Can I explain again how the T4 stays normal while the thyroid is being destroyed by Hashimoto's disease? So T4 is staying normal. TSH is rising. The pituitary size is rising. The, what's going on here is that as you kill, if, think of it like this. You kill some, uh, some of the thyroid. There's a little bit less T4. Therefore, there's a little bit more TSH. Also, um, uh, it's the thyroid, in this system, is a thyroid hormone that shrinks the pituitary. That's, it's a different mechanism. It's not that X1 makes pituitary grow here. It's thyroid hormone that shrinks the pituitary. So if I have a little bit less thyroid hormone, the pituitary also grows a little bit. It makes more TSH. And, 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 that, and, until, and when does it stop? When the thyroid, even though it's attacked and smaller, there's more TSH and it comes back to the original level of thyroid hormone. Now it's attacked a little bit more, less thyroid hormone, more TSH, growing, pituitary grows a little bit more. When does it stop? When T4 goes back to normal. And that's a, that's a compensation mechanism, the dynamic compensation mechanism that we discussed uh, also for beta cells. And then what's happening is the pituitary keeps growing. So more killing, more growing of the pituitary, more killing, more growing. And when this, it hits its carrying capacity, it can't compensate anymore, the killing is going to make T4 drop. Uh, Shai, I hope I explained. Please uh, ask me if I should explain more. Um, all right. Uh, why this difference? Why this arrow and not this arrow is a good question we're trying to understand. I mean, why? It's, it's, it's very similar effects, but we think this design is better for keeping constant hormone. This design, like in the adrenal, is good when you want the cortisol to go to change a lot according to stress. It's like a different design. This is like keeping homeostasis versus responding to stress. Um, how would you incorporate the action of self-reactive T cells in the diagram that you described? So what I would do, I would say that the thyrocytes are, are made and die. This parameter, a thyrocytes, the T cells Act, increase the death rate of thyrocytes. So um, we have this equation, the thyrocytes dt is thyrocytes times x2 TSH minus um, the turnover time of thyrocytes. And the killing increases this parameter. This, by the way, increases TSH. So we see that as we increase the killing, TSH rises in steady state. So that's why TSH rises when you increase the killing. That's a mathematical way to think about it. A TSH measurement actually is telling us the turnover rate of the thyrocytes, if you want, by, because of the immune killing. So mathematically, you can model all disease. I'm not doing the mathematics because I'm finding in this lecture that I can tell you the story in words and rely on the mathematics we already did in order for us to get a good enough approximation to the theory. And what causes the cyclical nature of thyroid death is again an unknown problem, but you can imagine that a feedback loop where if you attack the thyroid, it spills out this protein that excites the immune system more, can make a chance event multiplied into a huge burst, and then the immune system shuts itself off sometimes when it's over, and then another event, something like that. And Oh, the question is, does the thyroid stay the same size? Um, yeah, you can say that for a while. Um, it's, I'm not sure if the thyroid stays the same size, but the production of T4 is the same. So it could be that the thyroid is actually shrinking, but the, the TSH is growing. So the fewer thyroid cells have more stimulation by TSH to make thyroid hormone. Actually, I'm not sure. I think the thyroid is shrinking during this time. The thyroid size is shrinking, if I'm not mistaken. Maybe um, one of my students can correct me. So, um, yeah, okay. 
So we, we understand toxic nodules are mutants, the hypersensing mutant, the classic hypersensing mutants we describe, and they actually exist, and they happen, let's say, 1% of the population, toxic nodules. But an even bigger cause of hyperthyroidism is a weird disease. The last disease we'll talk about today, so I'm going to erase, is a bizarre disease. And there's no end to the wonder of uh, clinical medicine. It's called Graves' disease. And again, it, it, it happens in one, two percent of the population. It happens between age 20 to 50. It happens predominantly in women, but also in men. If you have a loved one or a hated one, doesn't matter, who feels their heart is beating too fast, they're weak, they're feeling hot, their mind is running like a, a little bit like a mania, anxiety, blah, blah. Trouble breathing because the thyroid also grows sometimes because, you know, hyperthyroidism also thyroid grows. We could constrict breathing, swallowing, bulging eyes in 30% of the cases because there's also TSH receptors for some reason in the muscles around the eyes. So we have this bulging eye phenomenon. Some actors have made a living out of it, like horror films. You have Graves' disease. And what is Graves' disease? Hyperthyroidism, caused by a bizarre autoimmune phenomenon. So we have our thyrocyte, it's making thyroid hormone, and it has the TSH receptor. In Graves' disease, the body makes antibodies that recognize TSH receptor, bind to it, and mimic TSH, so they activate it. So the body is full of antibodies that active, bind and activate TSH receptor. The, this, all the thyroid cells think there's too much TSH, they love TSH, and therefore they start dividing and secreting more T4. Isn't that weird? Why should the body make an antibody against TSH receptor? And why doesn't this happen for all the receptors in the body? Because we have thousands of receptors in the body. What's so special about the TSH receptor? Why is there no disease against the ACTH receptor? Why is there no disease against the LH receptor, the FSH receptor we talked about in ovulation, against the thousands of other receptors in the body? Why TSH receptor? Maybe we can understand that in the next lecture <laughs> if you're interested. Um, but that's the Graves' disease. How do you treat Graves' disease? So it depends if you're in America or in Europe, Israel. In America, as I understand it, it's like with the red elephant. How do you catch a red elephant? You know, you, or, you know, suppose you know how to catch a red elephant, how do you catch a white elephant? You make it embarrassed, it turns red, and you already know how to catch a red elephant. So you kill the thyroid with some radioactive iodine, because it's making too much thyroid hormone, and then you take the, the thyroid hormone pills for all your life. Okay, that's one approach. In Europe, Israel, more commonly, you take anti-thyroid drugs, that block the synthesis of T4. Okay. And you take them and you normalize your T4 level. And in about 50% of the cases, after one year, um, Graves goes away. I mean, I always say you can start reducing your antithyroid drug. And after a year, you can go to zero and you're fine. Some people, you're not fine. And then you need to do something else. Either keep, I think it, then you remove the thyroid and take the pills. So it's a more, let's say, this approach gives a chance for the body to get over this disease. Unlike Hashimoto, which never goes away, as far as I know, there's a kind of Hashimoto after pregnancy, postpartum Hashimoto, that also goes away. But the standard kind doesn't. The Graves' disease goes away in 50% of the time. If you normalize your TSH level, it, there's a higher chance it'll go away. And it's very interesting. And so we'll maybe talk about it also next lecture. Why does it go? 
<laughs> All right. Um, any questions about Graves' disease? Um, any questions about, so this is the, where are we, where are we in the, oh, toxic circuit. We talked about the circuit, toxic nodule in the circuit, the Graves' disease, the treatment, and now it says delay here, right? So I'm, I tell you about the delay. So just like in Hashimoto, let's see what happens in Graves' disease in terms of dynamics. I mean, you diagnose Graves' disease by having this, uh, uh, low TSH, high T4, and then you look for the TSH antibodies, TSH reservoir antibodies, and say, okay, you have Graves' disease in your blood testing. So here, let's do the dynamics. This is time, and now it's in months. This is a slower disease, and here we have our T4. Here we have our TSH. So we're normal, we're normal, we're normal. I want to be normal with you. We're normal, we're normal, we're normal, we're normal, we're normal. Here, um, Graves begins. So, uh, so uh, thyroid hormone, so the antibodies make more thyroid hormone. Right? They make more thyroid hormone, and therefore TSH drops, and it compensates. It's just the same idea. It compensates for the thyroid, for this is the compensation stage where TSH drops, 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 drops. So it drops, 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 drops. Pituitary also shrinks. What happens when you make more thyroid hormone, it shrinks the pituitary and it stops TSH. In fact, in Graves' disease, the pituitary atrophies, the, the thyrotropes in the pituitary atrophies and you lose pituitary mass. When pituitary hits basically zero, Thyroid, thyroid hormones. So this is the subclinical stage. Why is it subclinical? Thyroid is fine, but TSH is low. So that's people say, oh, you have a problem, but it, then thyroid hormone starts to rise. And, thyroid, and TSH, I'll tell you, if you ever have a loved one with, with Graves' disease, they'll do a TSH test and it'll say undetectable. Undetectable TSH. And now, of course, you go to the doctor and you start the treatment with anti-thyroid drugs. And over the months, thyroid hormone stabilizes. But TSH stays low on the floor and only stabilizes, if you're lucky, after three, six months. There's a huge delay here. And if it stabilizes TSH, you have a good chance for remission. That's to say that you can stop taking those drugs and you, you'll be fine. Uh, if it doesn't stabilize, that's higher risk for, for the disease staying and not going away. If you're smoking also, higher risk for the disease not going away, I don't know why. So there's a delay again. And the answer again is the pituitary, which starts very small and takes months to recover. So this mysterious delay is due to this Slow, slow part of the feedback loop. And the compensation is due to the ability of the pituitary to, to, to be plastic and compensate for the problems of the thyroid. Then maybe that's why there's a pituitary in all these axes. It can compensate, uh, keep, keep these crucial hormones steady despite Terrible things that happen, like very low iodine, the body attacking or activating the cells. There's a wide range, decades maybe, of compensation. So the pituitary is important. Um, 
as a compensating organ. So we said delay. This is, by the way, one, another name for this effect is called hysteresis. I'm not going to get into it. The pituitary as a major player. Um, and then we're kind of a, at the end of the lecture. We raised a lot of questions for the next lecture. We raised a lot of questions for the next lecture. Why? We can just end by asking why, right? Why? So why autoimmunity? Why some organs, not others? Why these particular antigens? TG and TPO and not a thousand other proteins that are unique to thyroid follicular cells. Uh, this disease is struck at a young age. So you have an 11 year old gets type one diabetes and without insulin injection would just die. This is 1% of the population would just die before reproductive age. So how can the body have a bug like that? Is it a bug or a feature? You can see. All this will be next lecture. Next lecture, we'll talk more about those T cells. Whose song is unsung. I'm just a T cell and my story is seldom told, educated in the thymus. I learned how to defend my country. Laying low, seeking out those lymph nodes where the other T cells go, seeking out the places only they will know. Nine and I, 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 Okay, we'll finish this song in the next lecture. Until then, let's take a nice deep sigh of relief. <sighs> and a nice blessing for all our organs and systems to keep on working in us and our loved ones. And I'll see you next week. <laughs>